This is the first of our centenary lectures. Uh, there will be three of these lectures this term and more uh, next term. This evening's lecture I'll say a little bit more about in a moment, but I draw your attention to the, the, the forthcoming lectures next month with uh, Patrick Legal from uh, Sciences Po in Paris, and in December, Neil Brenner from Harvard University. These lectures are open to all members of staff, students, and friends of the Bartlett School of Planning. And they're a centerpiece of our uh, centenary celebrations, and it's particularly good to see so many of our students here this evening. The purpose of the centenary celebrations is twofold. First, as a global center for learning and research uh, about the form, planning, design, and management of cities, we wanted to take the opportunity of our centenary uh, to hear from a range of leading thinkers from around the world, from home and abroad, uh, on the topics that are of interest to us. Second, we want to acknowledge our history Planning at UCL goes back a very long way, as you might guess, to 1914. Um, it has its origins in the appointment of Stanley Adshead as the first professor of town planning here, and in the holding of Sir Raymond Unwin's summer school in planning at, at UCL in the same year. So the history of teaching uh, and scholarship and planning at UCL is a rich one, indeed. It includes many of the great names of the discipline in, in the UK, including Sir Patrick Abercrombie, Lord Holford, Ruth Glass, Nathaniel Litchfield, uh, Lord Llewellyn Davis, uh, and Sir Peter Hall. And speaking of great names in the, in the discipline, I should now uh, introduce our speaker for the evening. Uh, Yvonne Ryden is Professor of Planning, Environment, and Public Policy at the Bartlett School of Planning. Uh, she came to UCL in uh, 2006 after a long a period at the LSE. Professor Ryden's research focuses on the governance of urban sustainability. Uh, and this is reflected in her uh, other important appointment as director of UCL Environment Institute. Her latest book uh, is The Future of Planning, which addresses the limits of growth, dependent, uh, growth dependence planning, the topic of her lecture this evening. So it's difficult to think really of a more appropriate uh, person or a more appropriate topic for the first of our centenary lectures. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Yvonne. Thank you, John. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of you for coming along uh, to hear this uh, lecture. In this talk, I want to present a critique of the currently dominant and, one might add, increasingly exclusive discourse of planning, which I termed growth-dependent planning. I'm going to suggest some alter proposals for alternative planning practice and for the necessary reforms to the planning system to support that practice. I took the opportunity of this book to actually try to make myself think, what would I like to change in the planning system? Which perhaps sometimes in academics we don't push ourselves to really think that through in detail. So that's what I've done here. It may put me out on a limb. There are proposals for discussion and debate, hopefully, afterwards. In this lecture, I also want to do something that I don't actually do uh, in the book that John mentioned which is I'm going to consider how this argument relates to contemporary debates in planning theory. As I said, this, in, this analysis is very much offered as an intervention to debates about planning theory and practice, and I do hope that there will be discussion about this, uh, both after my talk here um, and over wine later, and also a blog that I've set up, which I'll, I'll give the link at the um, end of the lecture. So for the last 60 or so years, debates about planning have largely taken the form of a tug and war uh, between two main approaches. On the one hand, there is what might might call visionary planning, typified by the development of strategic plans and master plans. And so you have things like Olmsted's plan for Prospect Park. You have the famous, and I'm glad to see Kay Henderson here somewhere, TCPA uh, Garden City diagram. Or we have diagrams like the, this from the Urban Task Force, uh, chaired uh, by Richard Rogers. There's a long tradition of this, based, I would say, in the environmental determinism of the earliest town planning efforts through the, that widely praised work on laying out garden cities to the idea of a design-led urban regeneration that was very influential in the late 20th century and I think into our century. While this approach has undoubtedly led to improvements in the quality of our urban fabric and particularly new urban fabrics, 
it has not been without its detractors. This is especially when it's been implemented in a top-down, expert-led manner. It can also readily, readily become the marketing face of market-led redevelopment, with an emphasis on landmark buildings and startling public sculptures. So on the other hand, there has been a, a quite different and strong thread of social critique and public challenging, dating perhaps from the uh, ad 1960s idea of advocacy planning put forward by Paul Davidoff, which has emphasized public participation and community engagement. It's an approach based in communication, in negotiation and mediation. And of course, the term collaborative planning, based on Patsy Healy's work, has been widely used to capture this. Although one might say if one compares these two, Patsy Healy's work perhaps widens the focus to stakeholder engagement in general, rather than the more uh, uh, limited emphasis or, or stronger emphasis on community engagement in Davidoff's work. And of course, there have been attempts to combine both of these, the best of both approaches, if you like, with design-led approaches that extensively involve local communities, say through charrettes and other innovative means of collaboration and consultation. But I'd like to suggest that the problems that the planning system faces, I think, today is not due to the limitations of either one of these approaches or the way that they are combined. I think the problem is that both of these approaches have increasingly come under the sway of an overarching discourse of planning, that is, I have termed growth-dependent planning. Both of these approaches, the visionary planning and the collaborative planning, are mainly about managing new development, and furthermore, they inevitably involve encouraging new development. They variously argue that some definition of the public good can be met through such management of development opportunities. And neither, and this is one of my key points, are that effective in the absence of development pressure. If you look at visionary planning approaches, they tend to identify the benefits to the broader public of particular forms of urban design. And particularly since the urban renaissance discussions of the 1990s, the importance of the design of public spaces and pedestrian thoroughfares, which is important, I, I grant that. Collaborative planning approaches look to the potential for meaningful community and stakeholder engagement to deliver a variety of outcomes with wider social benefit. But both approaches rely on amendments to the development design to improve urban qualities and also to generate planning gain or side benefits, such as affordable housing, off-site community facilities, and so on and so forth. But in the UK context, when we talk about new development, for many decades, this has overwhelmingly meant private sector development. Therefore, it is private sector development that it has to be redesigned and renegotiated to deliver the public benefits. And this puts the planning system into a very specific and dependent relationship with market processes. UK planning is effectively growth-dependent planning. Without market-led economic development, based on economic growth within the broader economy, planning isn't really able to exercise significant influence through urban design or visions, or participatory and stakeholder engagement activities. Furthermore, the public benefits that are generated generally have to come from the profitability of the development, or the landowner's share of the development gain, i.e. the rise in land value. So again, this puts pressure on the whole system to generate more higher value development in order to get more public benefits. So to summarise what I mean by growth-dependent planning, and that I'm then going to be sort of critiquing for the rest of the lecture and suggesting alternatives to, this is a type of planning that assumes there will be demand for new development. It seeks, and sometimes does manage to get, social and environmental benefits from that development. But it is therefore dependent on market-led development to get those benefits, and as a result tends to be dependent on, actively encourage and promote market-led development. Now, I want to suggest that the problems with this discourse and approach of market dependence on growth, market-led growth is threefold. Firstly, there's the economic side. Here we have a graph that just shows you variability in GDP. Anything above the red line is positive growth, below the line is negative growth, and it runs from uh, 71 to 2012. We know economic growth isn't a given. It varies. We're all acutely aware of periodic downturns that occur in economic activity, the most recent dating from the financial crisis of 2008. 
And one of the problems is that during these downturns, planning tends to go on to pause. So someone's hit the pause button and not very much can happen. But beyond these kind of temporal variations in economic growth that affect the effectiveness of, of planning, there's also a big question mark, I think, coming in the future as we go off the end of this graph to do with global restructuring of economic activity, to do with the huge shifts in demographic change that are occurring and on a European scale that I think must lead one to question whether we will ever return to the norm, let alone the highs, of post-war economic growth that uh, we have been used to. But of course, planning takes place in very specific locations and even in times of high national growth, even if we're in one of these areas above the red line, there will be places that do not feel the financial impact of growth and struggle to affect market-led projects. And there are loads of pictures of this sort that tell us what we already know, that this growth-dependent planning doesn't work in certain places, no matter what is happening in the terms of national growth. So essentially, growth-dependent planning is never reaching some of these places. The second critique is a social one, and this points to the long tradition of research, including considerable work that has been done within BSP, that shows the inequitable effects of much market-based urban development activity. Partly, this is due to the fact that market-led development has to aim at sectors of market demand and is driven by the ability and willingness to pay in those sectors rather than need, exemplified most tightly by the, the, the for sale boards of estate agents. Partly, it's due to the weakness of the so-called trickle-down effect. It's a rather nice cartoon that encapsulates that, but the idea here is that if you actually produce developments aimed at higher income groups, you create sufficient movement in the urban property markets, and you create flows of income that eventually will benefit the lower income groups. But here you'll see the champagnes run out well before we get uh, further down. And indeed, the evidence for the trickle-down effect, I think, is really very limited. Third critique is really to do with um, what happens when that development actually displaces existing low-income communities. And it's in the nature of market-led development that it's going to look for those areas of low property values uh, um, frequented by and occupied by low-income communities because there is where it's going to be able to sometimes make the biggest development gain through getting higher value development to occur on that. And here is a picture of a protest that some of you may know about. It actually takes place in Stratford. And so I'll leave you to work out what they're actually protesting about. But it was a certain form of gentrification. And of course, there's the more general idea of gentrification that just comes from not active displacement, but from waves of change of communities with people coming in with higher purchasing power, pushing those out with, local, uh, with lower purchasing power. So there's a strong social critique of growth-dependent planning as well. And thirdly, there are the concerns over environmental sustainability. Because of its reliance on development, it is relying on resource use. And uh, this is a picture of Jusen's builder's yard showing all those materials that go into um, any kind of new development. Now, I have to say there is quite a lot of debate over the exact nature of the linkages between environmental sustainability and new sustainability. There are debates that argue that resource efficiency can actually be increased very effectively through things such as the greater use of renewable materials and by approaches such as lean design. Uh, lean design and its application originally arose in manufacturing more generally. It was the idea that you could actually meet consumer demands by actually spending less on materials, on processes, on time. And that has now fed its way through to, to lean design, lean architecture, uh, where it's, it's largely about giving the client what they want with less. But as part of that argument, it's been argued you can actually have lean designs in terms of the resources used in the buildings and therefore be more resource efficient, uh, more carbon efficient in terms of the building one actually create. There's also a big debate over whether the, um, there is a trade-off between the amount of resources that go into new development and the reduced resources that come from more energy efficient and more water efficient forms of new development themselves. So you'll all be uh, familiar with the um, EPCs and the kind of energy ratings that we have nowadays. And there's quite a lot of research that's exploring whether there would actually be a net saving over a building's lifetime arising from new development, which encourages more resource efficiency in, in um, operation and occupation. <coughs> 
And I think there is a sense in which new market-led development can contribute to more environmentally sustainably pathways by producing a more resource-efficient built environment. But I think that has to be seen in the context of two points. First, there is the importance of social behaviour in actually creating environmental impacts, which the design of the built environment can only partially influence. When I was involved in the uh, government's foresight report on energy and the built environment, we had a mantra, people use energy, not buildings. So in a sense, the design aspect and the promotion of new development can't guarantee more environmentally sustainable outcomes. It can just provide uh, a design within which people uh, generate, uh, hopefully, lower environmental impacts. And the second point, and I think this is more important for my argument, is the limited impact that new development has on overall environmental uh, impact of the built environment. The built stock in this country turns over relatively slowly. In prime areas, in growth areas, the City of London, Cambridge perhaps, the rate can be higher. But um, in many residential and community areas, buildings last a very long time. And these areas require quite a different approach, really, to improve their environmental performance. It's a quote from the, the Foresight Report. It's actually a footnote that was tucked away, but it uh, contains some really important statistics. We all know that by 2050, 65 to 70 percent of the dwelling stock in existence is likely to have been built before 2000. But just over half of all commercial industrial properties were built between 1940 and only 9 percent after 1990. Just over a quarter of building space, commercial building space by area, was built uh, before 1940, and only 15% since 1990. So particularly in the, in the commercial area, as well as the residential area, we have a lot of old stocks that we need to think about. So to summarize some of the key problems with growth-dependent planning as I see it, they concern ineffectiveness in conditions of low demand, whether you think about that varying over time or spatially, a failure to meet the needs of low-income communities because it's very much attuned to meeting market demand and willingness and ability to pay. Further, the danger of displacement of low-value land uses and low-income communities in situations where new, there's demand for higher-value land uses in new development. And a lack of attention to the environmental sustainability of the whole built stock. But just to be clear, I do think that there will be situations, places and times when growth dependent planning is appropriate, when it can actually deliver social and environmental benefits. And at the end of the lecture, I'll come back to specifying more clearly when I think those circumstances are right. The problem isn't the existence of this discourse per se, it's its unthinking dominance. Now, a major reason why this discourse has, has such currency in planning policy and practice is that it is embedded in key documentation, such as central policy guidance. And I think this has been particularly apparent, though, though I think actually this predates 2012, but it is now particularly apparent because of the national planning policy framework that we currently have. And I'll give you just one quote, but you can go through it, and in the book I do go through it in more detail, and you can identify lots of these points. Page one tells us, page I tells us, development means growth. We must accommodate the new ways by which we will earn our living in a competitive world. Our lives and the places in which we live them can be better, but they will certainly be worse if things stagnate. I think most people agree that this kind of pro-growth um, ethos underpins, runs right through uh, the NPPF. So if we need to, going to recognize that there needs to be, that growth dependent planning doesn't work in all places at all times, then an alternative discourse also needs to be embedded in central policy guidance. I'd like to suggest here that the concept of just sustainability might perform the basis for such an alternative. Just sustainability is a concept that's been developed recently by Julian Agerman. Uh, he was a, a keynote lecturer at our Environment Institute annual conference last year. He's written a book called Just Sustainability, so you can find that readily. Uh, he developed his ideas from initial work with Bob Evans and Richard Bullard. And what just sustainability does is it seeks to address concerns that the sustainability agenda is insufficiently attuned to social inequality and that it, instead it tends to treat sustainable outcomes as a common good, as something that's a public good, a common good, good for all of us and therefore we don't need to think too much about whether actually how individual social groups are actually benefiting or suffering um, uh, under uh, sustainable or unsustainable outcomes.
And so what he does is he challenges the idea, idea of sustainability as something that's equally important for all social groups. And instead he argues for attention to the socially inequitable outcomes of environmentally unsustainable practices. And also to the need for achieving sustainability, I think this is a very important part of his book, in ways that are socially and culturally sensitive to inequality and injustice. It builds on the environmental justice, particularly in the USA, but it goes beyond that because of the tendency of that literature to fail to distinguish the ne negative environmental impacts falling on higher and lower income groups. And it also critiques environmental justice for a lack of concern with intra-general e racial equity and a in tendency instead to focus on economic harm per se. So the just sustainability alternative, as identified Julian Ageman, is, is incorporates in general the following. You need to improve quality of life and well-being to meet the needs of present and future generations through a focus on inter but also intra-generational equity. The importance of justice in terms of recognition, processes, procedures and outcomes and the overriding importance of living within ecosystem limits. And Julian further argues for culturally sensitive forms of local policy that identify the needs of local communities and also further express their identity. So I would suggest that a first reform that is actually needed is something like the MPPF, if we're going to live with it, needs to be revised to incorporate the concept of just sustainability. Now, you might say, well, that's very nice, pie in the sky, but it is possible. And I think we can look across to what the Clinton administration achieved in 1994 when it put a requirement on the Environmental Protection Agency that meant that they had to consider justice and distributional impacts when taking decisions. More than that, they had to have regard to the environmental and human health conditions of minority and low-income populations specified and that's supported by a dedicated Office of Environmental Justice. It would therefore be possible to include a similar justice provision in relation to urban planning and perhaps create an Office of Planning Justice. Now the challenge here is that that involves recognising that planning needs to treat specific groups differently. And I think UK planning has a problem with that. It has a problem with that both legally and ideologically. The idea of treating all parties to the planning system equally, particularly within the procedures of plan making and regulatory decision making, has very strong constitutional roots. I think when I started as a, a PhD student, Mike Hebert, who's at the back, alerted me to the importance of the Franks Commission, which I think encapsulates that absolutely. But I think the planning pr profession more generally feels more comfortable when it feels that it's actually operating for the benefit of all and therefore doesn't like the idea that it's going to have to treat some groups differently to others, leaving quite aside the political protests that that might generate from Middle England. But procedural equality is often not sufficient to protect low-income communities from plans and decisions that would adversely affect them. And further, there may actually be a need in planning regulation to recognise positively the specific needs of such communities in the decisions that are taken, and I'll come back to that. So my first point is I think we need to have some way of embedding actually an alternative concern with justice in our core planning policy guidance. Secondly, I think local authorities need to be given a little bit of guidance as to know when to rely on growth dependent planning, which I do think has its time and place, and when to recognise that isn't appropriate and some alternative needs to actually uh, be considered. And I think there are a range of questions that can be asked or a local authority can ask itself. First set of questions are really asking, is growth dependent planning appropriate? So if the answer to these questions are yes, then growth dependent planning, the way that we've been operating and relying on for the few, last few decades, is fine. Are the economic conditions right for this mode to be effective? Will sufficient social and environmental benefits be generated? Will these be equitably distributed? And does the proposed development, together with a negotiated planning gain, command the support of local communities? If you can answer yes to those questions, then it seems to me growth dependent planning is actually a good form of planning to actually be following. But there will be many circumstances when the answer to these questions, or one or more of these questions, is no. So I think there's another set of questions you can ask when you think, well, maybe the alternative I'm setting out would actually be more appropriate. 
Are there vulnerable groups in the locality who already have a lesser share of society's benefits, who are losing out through the change that is occurring due to development and change of use? And is the change that is occurring contributing to a pathway towards a more environmentally sustainable future for the locality? So if the answer to the first one is yes and the answer to the second one is no, I didn't quite phrase those right, then I think we need to look for an alternative. And what I want to do now is to turn to some suggestions for what that alternative might look like in practice. So moving down from the general principle, the discourse embedded in central policy, through to thinking about when you might need to use this alternative to thinking what it might actually comprise. And I broadly put this under the heading of community-based approach. And I think there are three different aspects of a community-based approach that can be identified, all of which go beyond the calls for collaborative planning as set out uh, in the literature. More, it involves much more than simply more engagement with community. The important point to note is that they all involve a range of planning tools that need to be operationalized to deliver new outcomes in terms of the built environment. So collaboration through plan making will not be sufficient. And at the end, I'm going to suggest some uh, uh, tools and uh, reforms to, that will actually generate those kind of tools. So the first kind of element of this approach is in encouraging and promoting community-based development. And I think there are two features that are actually bound up in truly community-based development. One concerns the involvement of the local communities, I suppose one ought to say that in plural, in deciding the nature of new development, and I think that we're fairly familiar with, that requires a form of collaborative planning, good community engagement processes used by skilled planners. But the other is the ability of those communities to share in the profits of development and any growth in land values. And that second point requires the use of land ownership as a planning tool, something we have been phenomenally bad at in this country, particularly if you compare that to other countries in Europe. And I was just in particular the retention of freeholds in development sites and associated public spaces by a community organisation. And this is the radical core of the model for the garden cities that was put forward by Ebenezer Howard and his collaborators over a century ago. And I do encourage everybody to find it. I'm not even sure if it's in the UCL library, uh, to actually read the original of Garden Cities for Tomorrow, because great chunks of it are actually about the business model, the financial model, the land ownership tools, and not about layout and design. There's been much emphasis on those design features, but the truly radical element was the idea of retaining the freehold in common ownership and granting developers leaseholds. This model retains control in the community landowners' hands and then can generate a revenue stream through ground rents and eventually passes the sites back to the community for development. Community land trusts are the current form of such community-based development. And since we're celebrating 100 years of the BSP, I would like to take a few mentions in this section to uh, give a few mentions in this section to current and region research students at the BSP who are doing research that I think is of great relevance to the agenda I'm sketching out. And the first person I want to mention is Daniel Fitzpatrick. I'm not sure if he's here. Who's working under the guidance of Nikos Karadimitriou and who's researching just such community-based development organisations. So we should all read his thesis when it's finished, which I think it's soon. The second form. Uh, of community-based approach I want to look at are the need to find new means of protecting but also improving low-value property areas. I mean, we need to try and find means that improve low areas but don't resort to the gentrification and replacement of existing land uses and communities. And this is really difficult because you need so many forms of area improvement get captured in property values. And it's very difficult to think about what you can change that would actually improve things for the local community but won't lead to that kind of property capture. There are certain things that one can uh, think about doing, and I will come back to some specific examples last, but I'd also like to turn to another BSP research student, Jessica Firm, uh, who worked under the guidance of Claudia de Magales to provide a very cogent critique of policies towards workplaces for SMEs in new developments, which she argued did not meet the needs of local businesses. And instead, she called for policies to protect employment generating land uses and the targeted provision of premises for local SMEs. The third kind of area of reform I'd like to refer to is new means of providing community assets, including new means of management and ownership of those kind of assets. That's necessary because privatised means of meeting community needs are inevitably going to exclude 
certain parts of the community because they will inevitably be driven by ability to pay. But he raised a lot of challenges over how such community assets should be funded and managed and how conflicts over their use should be handled within the local community stroke communities. The BSP research students' work I would like to mention here is that by Amiko Kusakabe, who did work in a Japanese context on the role of local communities in providing a whole range of facilities and environmental services. She pointed to the importance of social capital within local communities to support this activity, which is referred to as machisukuri in Japan. Social capital building, I think, is central to the ability of local communities to undertake these ongoing tasks with regard to community assets. And building this such social capital is a task well beyond that usually covered by participatory or collaborative planning practice and operates on quite a different time scale. So it poses a challenge for the way the planning system works. So this approach, these foci within a community-based approach, I think suggest quite a, a different set of reforms, very targeted, detailed reforms that will be ne necessary to deliver the tools that can actually uh, provide this community-based approach. So what I want to do next is turn to uh, another more detailed set of planning reforms. And before I just outline these, I, perhaps I should say very clearly that the planning system is not going to be able to solve all the problems of lower income communities and lower priced areas. In my view, a revised welfare state encompassing income support, healthcare, education, and a substantial public housing sector will all be necessary. Planning can be one small element in contributing to a new approach, but we shouldn't, in my view, overstate what planning on its own can do. It's necessary, but uh, uh, not necessarily can do everything on its own. Sometimes I think we claim too much for planning. And even to do this necessary small element, planners are going to need new tools. In the last chapter of the book, um, I set out quite a long list of reforms. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to pick out a few uh, ideas that I've put in there. You may or may not agree with them. That's fine. They're very much put forward there for debate. So the first couple of ideas I put under the heading of rec giving recognition to the importance of addressing inequality. And one idea I've put forward is the idea that perhaps we need support for an implementation of an exceptions policy where it can be demonstrated that the development would need the needs of lower income communities. This borrows the idea of rural exceptions policy, whereby the idea is that you have policies uh, about the scale of development that are very, very firmly applied to prevent any form of speculative uh, development occurring trading on low land values to get high value development. So you, you, this has to be on the basis of strong uh, regulation and implementation of existing policies. But that if you can demonstrate that a development would particularly meet the needs of low income communities, then you can exceptionally give planning permission for that. If you do it that way, then actually the current use value of the land that that permission is being given on won't actually be boosted by speculative development. and means you can actually provide development, hopefully at lower cost, to meet those needs. So that's one idea. A second idea, and the terminology, nomenclature here is not right, but what about designating community assets supporting justice and sustainability, to providing a new form of designation that would enable certain land uses valued by the community because they promote equality and environmental sustainability that will enable those land uses to be protected in a specific kind of way. Another couple of ideas. And these I put under the heading of giving recognition to the environmental justice imperative, particularly the environmental dimension. I suggest it might be important to have support for area improvement plans, both for residential and town centre areas, that put an emphasis particularly on energy efficiency and other environmental values that are not significantly valued by the market. Now, I think we're in a moment at, the, uh, at present where environmental efficiency measures are not always feeding through into market processes. There's research that's been done, including research in BSP, that suggests in some areas it is beginning to feed through. But I think we can still identify certain energy efficiency and other kinds of environmental improvements that won't be capitalised in, in rising property values. And perhaps those are the things we should focus on when we think about area improvement policies for residential and commercial areas. Another idea is that when we are faced with uh, proposals for eco-build alternatives that contribute to just sustainability aims, perhaps we should be adopting some flexibility in the way in which we apply development control standards. 
Now, this isn't a plea for, you know, allowing planning permission for grand design eco-homes of the sort that you, you see, uh, you know, presented in the TV programme. Uh, the idea here is more of eco-build options that would meet those needs of lower-income communities, and hence the, the dual aims of just sustainability. The third couple of ideas I put under the heading of giving recognition to the value of what's already there. I think we need in planning to recognise more fully the importance of secondary and tertiary suffering areas of SME spaces, such as those at Jessica Research, and of markets. And perhaps we need to think about using policies that specify scales and even occupiers to protect small-scale uses from amalgamation and for redevelopment. I know that's not legal at the moment. I know there are problems with that. But maybe we should think about how to make that legal so that small-scale land uses and uses for particular classes of occupiers can actually effectively be used within regulation to protect those small-scale uses and existing users. Another thing I think we could do more with is recognising the value of temporary uses and of the need to make use of vacant land and properties, and there's a variety of measures one can do to promote that, including, but not only, uh, meanwhile, uh, leases. And the last couple of measures I'd like to suggest is giving greater institutional resources to enable planning to operate in the face of growth-dependent planning. An example of that might be releasing sites for community-based development at existing use value and enabling, and it has to go with this, community land ownership structures. I think too many of the proposals at the moment are about handing public land over for community-based development, which will then just enter into market processes and the first buyers and first builders will actually just get the benefit of increasing property values. So the two have to go together, land release at current use, existing use value and new land ownership structures. And another idea might be, and again this would probably be controversial, to relax the strict application of precedent in regulatory decision making. I think the idea that you have to be very careful about precedents you set in uh, planning de development control because that will tie your hands for later development control, it, it, it does just that, it ties planners' hands. And I wonder if there's a way in which one can actually try to get round the strict application of precedent where you are particularly want to allow development that meets the needs, the, the test of delivering well-being and just sustainability. So what I hope I've done so far is to persuade you for the need for a new planning discourse, one that allows alternatives for growth-dependent planning to be adopted, where that's deemed, deemed appropriate by local authorities and local communities, and which is based on just sustainability. I've also given a few uh, concrete planning reforms that could at least be debated. A new discourse, even if embedded in central government gu guidance, will not be enough. There is a need for new planning tools in the planning system to make community-based alternatives a reality. And they need some debate to be fleshed out and to be tested. OK, what I want to do in the last few minutes of this lecture is to turn to planning theory and I want to speculate on the implications of this kind of thinking about planning for planning theory and uh, vice for, for planning for planning theory and vice versa. So we're going to go into a slightly different kind of realm of, of thinking, but I hope to be able to persuade you that they are connected to some of the more concrete things I've been talking about so far. There's been a fascinating explosion of theorizing on planning systems, processes and practices in the last decade. Much of this has addressed the perceived limitations of collaborative planning theory, which has been the main focus of discussion in planning theory conference sessions and specialist journals since the mid-1980s. This new wave of theorizing has been quite diverse, as one would expect when a hegemonic approach is being challenged, but I think you can characterize it as drawing on a set of key uh, sources and resources. And I'd list these as these. Firstly, there's been a revived interest in Foucault's body of work, uh, particularly as interpreted by Nick Rose and Peter Miller, to develop the governmentality thesis, in which processes of discourse construction, along other aspects of institutionalization, enable governing at a distance, um, uh, increasing interest in whether how that applies in different planning contexts. There's been the influence of postmodern thinking uh, that has weakened the belief in strong narratives including the role of plans in creating such narratives. And instead, plans are, are often seen as a form of experimentation. To, do, to use Jean Hillier's work, they're always becoming and only resting in apparently fixed formulations. Very, very interesting. I find it difficult sometimes to work out how you actually operationalize that in practice. 
but it's, it's again quite influential at the moment. Thirdly, I think there's been a much more general acceptance of, of a relational perspective, um, underpinning quite a lot of social science thinking, drawing on, but, but usually through translation interpretation, certainly by my, myself, I've not read the originals, of the work of Deleuze and Gartieri, but through translation, I think those ideas have been filtering through. And finally, there's been a growing interest in the materiality of social life, which has been elaborated through ideas, application of ideas from science and technology studies, including actor network theory, and fits quite nicely with a relational perspective. And it's this last one I want to draw attention to, because I think this has the most relevance, in my mind, to the new agenda for planning practice, as the, at least as the way I conceive it. Now, of course, planning practice has always known that it's engaged with the material. The first thing we do with many of our students is take them out on a walk out into the built environment. But I think planning theorising theorizing has had perhaps a rather specific and limited take on the material. The kind of visionary planning I talked about at the beginning has always tended towards a form of environmental determinism. It relies, as the term that's often used, master planning, it implies mastery of the material environment in order to shape social behavior. Again, as the name implies, it identifies a master who will bring his, and it often is his, expert knowledge to how the material shapes the social and economic encounters and outcomes to that task of reshaping the material environment. So the material enters planning through professional knowledge and expertise in this kind of approach. Collaborative planning has taken a rather different approach. It's emphasized the interaction of social actors in dialogue with each other to deliver strategic agreements on how the physical environment should or should not change. Time aspect can be immediate, as with deliberation on an imminent development proposal, or longer term, as with the, with the creation of a spatial strategy for an area, city, or even region. The emphasis within collaborative planning is largely on planning as a social process where the material becomes involved in the debates through interventions involving knowledges, and I use the word in the plural deliberately. Social actors represent the material through their engagement with the material, whether that's through reporting on their everyday experience or through the mediation of documentation, assessments, techniques, calculations, and so on and so forth. The range of such actors and of relevant knowledges can be much, much wider than in the kind of visionary, more design-led planning. And another of BSP's research students, Luti Natarajan, has been researched just this in her study um, of a collaborative enterprise in Northamptonshire. What the kind of approach, uh, community-based approach that I've been discussing in this lecture today involves, I think, is a much more detailed and immediate encounter with the material. It's an approach, well, an approach is needed in which it's recognized that the material has agency. This is increasingly being acknowledged by planning theorists and by some urban designers as well. Here, the physical environment is not just passive in the face of the expertise of designers or planners or the interpretation of stakeholders. Rather, it makes an active difference. In Latour's terms, it resists. So the physical environment is both socially constructed, including in the form of multiple knowledge claims, but it's also re real. It shapes and is shaped by people's everyday encounters with their locality. It shapes and is also shaped by planning practice. It takes its place in the complex networks of relationships that constitute planning activity and urban change. Now, why is this renewed focus on materiality from a more sort of socio-technical studies perspective relevant to the planning reform agenda that I've outlined above? Firstly, I think that the community-based approach that I've been advocating requires the existing materiality of local environments to be taken seriously and seen in terms of the details of its everyday interactions with people in their homes, in public spaces, in shopping, taking the kids to school, and so on. This is both detailed work and embedded in the here and now. And I think that can very readily be eclipsed by a focus on the future and on the broader scale in which people, individuals, families, social groups don't feature except as collectives. So to summarize, what I'm arguing for from a more planning theoretical perspective 
is a focus on the detailed, on what's been termed small work within some writers um, uh, in this area. Associated attention to the locality, taking the very local seriously. Embedding this in the here and the now rather than in the long future. And restricting, resisting the view of social life in terms of collective entities, which I think very often brushes over this detail and also evens out inequalities. And I think particularly looking at this last person in a bit more detail, seeing social actors as collectivities seems to me something that the growth dependent approach slips into very easily. Existing sets of detailed relations between the local materiality and myriad social encounters are swept away in favor of an alternative, a new development proposal. And the emphasis on the collective, the aggregate, then very easily disguises the inequalities in existing socio-material situations and also in the proposed development outcomes. Remember, these are market-led development outcomes. Where people do buy into the future that is proposed at the broader scale through participation which actively recognizes the nature of current lives lived in very specific material contexts, and then imagines future lived lives in equal socio-material detail, then it may have a role to play. Again, I don't want to say growth-dependent planning never works. But as I've argued, the promises of growth-dependent planning are hollow in many situations. Planning needs to rediscover a way to act in these many other situations. And that's going to involve much small work, taking seriously the detailed nature of people's current interaction with the materiality of their environments. Some urban designers have begun to see their work in this light. Here, participatory methods are allied with design seen as an intervention in the socio-material relations of the urban system. Where collaborative planning tends towards planning for real exercises and takes off from community-led um, exercises and encountering the materiality of the locality, then it's also recognizing the material in a new way. And while Ector network theories and other conceptual approaches that discuss the material in relation to the social can often seem very abstract, expressed in difficult language, the irony is that it suggests a planning approach that's actually grounded in the small, in the everyday, the local. That part of the environment that people, us, encounter most directly and personally. I think planning theorizing is important. It can help the development of the bigger picture about what is being attempted through community-based planning, say. It may contribute to a shift in the way that we think about planning. But for all that, I think for community-based planning approach to become more of a reality, it's going to require new institutional frameworks that give social actors new resources to exercise power in the complex actor networks of urban change. The agenda that I seek to discuss in this book and in this lecture is just a small step to creating such a reformed institutional framework. So I thank you for your attention. I please do ask you to join in the debate, not just now, but I have set up a, a blog uh, at blogspot.co.uk. It's called Beyond Growth, Growth Dependent Planning, and if you Google it, you find it. So if you don't get a chance to have your say here and now, please do join in the debate on that social media. Thank you. OK. Uh, right, well, thank you very much, Yvonne, uh, for a presentation which ranged over key developments in theory, in practice, in policy, and explored the linkages between all of those things. And, and in that sense, of course, was a presentation in the, very much in the tradition of uh, research and scholarship and teaching here at uh, Bartlett. Um, so, questions, uh, criticisms, contributions? The floor is over to you. Duncan. Uh, Can you say who you are, Duncan? Uh, Duncan Barry, University of Western Source, having been a visiting lecturer here for the last three years. Um, uh, very interested in the critique you put forward of, of growth dependent planning, with which I substantially agree. But as I think you were touching on at the end, your, your critique is effectively a critique of market led development. And, and I think, in a sense, it's important to make that more explicit distinction. Um, I think what concerns me, in a sense, is that your focus very much on community-based planning 
incorporating forms of community asset management, mm -hmm. although you gave a couple of examples, you didn't necessarily go into too much detail. Mm -hmm. um, what I, I don't understand is how you can then conclude that this actually evens out inequalities. No, I didn't. Because that. I don't understand how this will fundamentally mm -hmm. challenge um, market-led development and deal with those fundamental inequalities both in terms of wealth, income, asset control mm -hmm. and power, not just within communities, mm -hmm. but the fundamental issue of uh, spatial injustice, mm -hmm. disparities between areas, which surely need uh, intervention and powers uh, and funding and need redistribution at a much higher level. I mean, I, I agree, with you, I know you refer to the need to keep the welfare state, or at least re-establish the welfare state. Revive. And, and to need to have a social housing programme, which we no longer have. Yeah. Um, but I think the community asset approach, while interesting in specific locations, is relatively marginal to dealing with the fundamental critique which you started with. Um, I don't disagree with you, and I think I did say that planning couldn't yeah. deal with that on its own. And I think that's absolutely right. And, and um, we shouldn't look to it to do that. So my, what I was trying to do was to try to think, well, how can we reform what planning does in order to contribute to some kind of alternative approach that takes more account of the needs of low-income communities and such? Now, I, I totally agree with you. That, I mean, it's not going to solve the problem on its own. I think I said that, that very explicitly. But the, my concern is that planning at the moment only does the one thing. Is there not something else that the planning system could do with certain reforms that might make a marginal difference? But you know, I still think that if you embed certain tools and approaches within a planning system and you enable many examples of that to happen, then that seems to me to actually could con collectively make a contribution. I think we have a great tendency to, to, in planning to sometimes to want to do things on a big scale because then we'll solve the problems all at once. And very often all that happens is you create problems on a bigger scale as well. I think there is something to be said for lots and lots of examples of the small work to be done, but it's not sufficiently supported by the planning system currently. And that's what I was trying to suggest. What can the planning system do if it's going to do something other than growth-dependent planning? I didn't suggest, and I, I said explicitly that, that it, that would be sufficient to deal with the fundamental problems. And I would say, I mean, a renewed, so long ago, it's hardly renewed, is it? A new program of council house building would go a hell of a long way to that. But that's, whether we're in a situation to do that is another question. Okay. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank talk, you. So thank you very much. Um, my question is, how would you convince the current government to take on board your proposed uh, reforms, um, given that the current government is almost entirely driven by uh, the growth agenda. And also that while your community-based planning agenda is, it actually appears to be quite a bit in line with, um, with the original green paper, open source planning, it actually mm. involves a lot of state intervention, um, several uh, policy reforms, mm -hmm. several new reforms, mm -hmm. and a new mm. institutional framework. Yeah. And this government started with yeah. uh, the bonfire of the Pringles, mm -hmm. the, removing a tier of governance, and the one in, one out, and now the one yeah. in, two out mm -hmm. policy mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, rule. So given that context, <laughs> how would, how should I as a planner go to the current government and encourage them to take on board? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Easy one, yeah. Um, well, I could answer to say that, that your analysis of the current government is right. I can't see Eric Pickles buying into this. And, you know, we wait for, you know, what is it, 2015 <laughs> for some form of change. That could be one answer. Um, the other answer is to say that there are aspects of the localism agenda that can be used as a Trojan horse. Um, the difficulty, as you say, is right, is that there are some quite fundamental um, institutional aspects of the planning system would actually need to be changed within this. Um, and it's difficult to see that happening without central government direction. Um, perhaps if there was sufficient debate on this within the planning system, some might slip through without being noticed. I don't know. Um, but I think it's more than that. I think there are some fundamental things that the planning profession takes for granted that I think it needs to start to address and debate uh, in order to set the groundwork for those kind of reforms to even 
get to anybody's table who might, 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 might implement them. And I do think there are the, this is the idea that, that the planning profession doesn't seem comfortable with this idea that it's going to have to do something different and special for certain groups. It always wants to act in the common interest, in the public good, for the benefit of everybody. You know, and I, I just I think that it's going to have to bite that bullet and say that isn't the case. I mean, there are some interesting examples of, of, of policies that um, suggested the exceptions policy. Why I picked up the rural exceptions policy is that's one example that's been around for quite a long time now. That does actually have this idea that you, you may need to teach a specific group, i.e., people in rural communities who can't afford local ha housing, and do something specific for that particular kind of group. Uh, another interesting thing is the debate that has been over the conversion of offices uh, to residential uh, flats. And the big debate that happened, I was on the West End Commission while that was going through, and a big debate about you know, well, the ch difference that would make to Fitzrovia and to Soho if that was allowed to happen. All those small SMEs that would actually lose their business premises because they would be ousted by higher value re uh, um, re residential development. So there are little, I mean, I have picked up on things that are partly already existing with the planning system to suggest some reforms that might occur, and partly identified some really quite big things that I think need to be debated in the planning system if this kind of agenda is to be pursued. But, you know, I'm opening up a date. I'm not expecting, you know, pickles to call me tomorrow. Community engagement. Um, I think it's quite interesting because we are about next week, I think, to have a staff meeting in which we discuss new kind of areas that we might be uh, developing our, our own programs here. And I think one of the areas we'll be debating is whether we need to have some more skills training in the BSP um, on participatory processes, on community engagement. But I think, in a sense, we need to go beyond that to the kind of community building exercise of which there are some very, very good guidance out there. I mean, some community building handbooks that are absolutely fantastic, that are ways, basically, of building social capital within local communities. Much more common in the American context, where the whole advocacy planning approach has encouraged planners to work with communities. But those are skills that are relatively light here, although Mike Edwards is working hard to enable some students also to develop those skills in practice here within BSP. So I'd point to those. Dominic Curran from uh, London Council's Planning Policy Officer. Um, thanks very much for a, a fascinating lecture. It, contrary to the previous question, I, I detected some support for the government's uh, planning agenda. So, uh, I interpreted some of what you said, and I hold my brief, yeah. and it was uh, as support for uh, assets of community yeah. value, yeah. community right to build, yeah. uh, even a neighbourhood distribution yeah. of sewer uh, to share the um, but I, I, uh, there's a lot to sort of pick up on, but mm. I think I kept coming back to one question throughout your, your lecture, which was who pays? Because even in yeah. a non growth dependent planning world, planners need to be paid from central government, yeah. local taxes, and that only comes from economic growth. Yeah. Community projects need to be funded, yeah. and that comes from maybe cash resources, mm. maybe central, maybe local government funding. You know, Unfortunately, or fortunately, mm. depending on your point of view, we live in a capitalist world, and every, there's always a bill at the end of it. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you're making two points. So can I deal with them separately? One, yeah, I think, that, like I said, I think there are our aspects in the localism agenda that actually are quite positive. Okay? And that's why I said it could be used as a Trojan horse. Usually they aren't fully formulated in a way that I think buys into this agenda. So, for instance, you know, the, the tendency to provide sites for self-build or for community-based development, but not recognising that the land ownership structure has to be different if that's actually going to contribute to something different, you know, generations and market transactions down the line. So, yes, there are elements in there that are useful. I think they're not always fully formulated or properly formulated in a way that meets this agenda. Um, and there are others as well that one can add. Now, your second point, I mean, let me make this clear. I'm not arguing against growth, okay? I, if growth comes, we'll all be happy, by and large, apart from a certain number of environmentalists who would favour a zero growth approach. I don't see how capitalism works with a zero growth approach, because I don't think the whole process of interest and yield and rate of return works in a zero growth situation. So I'm not advocating that. If growth comes back, great. That means more areas will be able to benefit from growth-dependent planning. And that's great, 
You know, some areas will benefit from that. It works in some kind of locations. Communities are happy with it, they buy into it, they get benefits from it. So I'm not arguing against growth, and I'm not arguing against growth-dependent planning. I'm saying that there are times and places where it doesn't work. And I do think we need to face the possibility that the UK is going to be living in a lower growth future when there will be more places where you can't get a developer to do this. And the panelists have no one to engage with then to do growth-dependent planning. So I'm trying to suggest that in those circumstances, you need to, to do something. Now, I mean, who will pay planners? I suppose who will pay planners will always be who pays planners, which they'll, you know, it'll come from generalised taxation in some senses. But it does raise an interesting issue about how some of the more community-based alternatives should be funded. And in the book, I do talk about, and I mean, even as I wrote it, I, f I felt there was an element of wishful thinking in this, about some more alternative ways of actually crowdsourcing funding, of, of you know, social uh, funding mechanisms. <laughs> Um, there is now a growing social enterprise culture. There are growing ways in which people buy into green and ethical financing and investment. Uh, there was a very funny map that was produced in one of the Sunday papers that showed they were all lived in, I think it was North London, uh, East Oxford, <laughs> a bit of Bristol and a bit of Sheffield. But I mean, there, there are still, uh, you know, a, a, a small but growing movement that is looking to put funding into something other than the conventional capitalist finance investment opportunities. So maybe that might be a starting point. Okay. Yes, sir. Steve Boxall from Regeneration Ethics and Freelance Generation Consultants. Um, with a properly evidenced uh, local plan and willing politicians, do you think you could go some way to delivering what you're talking about tonight? Um, no. I, I, to be honest, I know. Because <laughs> I, I think we need some institutional reform. I think we really do need oh. new tools, new institutional arrangements. Yes, I mean, I, I, and local political will can go a certain way. Uh, I'll give another example. It was in the, in the papers again on Sunday. Um, I've forgotten the name of the village. There's a village in Spain that has been very effective at creating community-based activism in a very difficult economic circumstance to the point where they have 5% unemployment, which is amazing in a Spanish context. Led by a local mayor, so with the political will you identify, but the key to making that actually work is they got land transfer. They got some land transferred from what seemed to be an absent uh, aristocratic landowner to enable them to undertake new kinds of activities. So yes, political will is important, but I think you're going to need new kinds of tools. The role of a plan in it, I, I'm not sure about. There's a question down here, you had your hand up. Yes, it seemed, it seemed to me that um, the core of this discussion is the crisis of capitalism, both in terms of this ongoing growth and, and decline in capitalism, and the you say you're not against growth in, in certain areas, in certain ways, but at the same time, the, um, the prospect of alternative forms of um, of financing development, conceiving development, um, different forms of ownership. That was a, a perfect case in the Spanish town where the, uh, the town was ceded mm. land and was able to adopt what would be essentially a non-capitalist mm. system that is proving to be very, uh, very functional in, in that context. That aren't we, uh, aren't we at that at that juncture where it's time to rediscuss the issue of, of how capitalism works and does it work? Uh, possibly. It's a, it's a much bigger debate. I mean, I would just pick up with you on one thing. I don't think actually the Spanish example was a something that was kind of separate from capitalism. I think it was a cooperative enterprise that was engaged with other kind of market-based processes, but on its own terms. And I think, in a sense, what that points to is that we have a tendency to think that um, everything has to be marketised, that everything has to run through markets. But actually, when you talk to any of our colleagues over in development planning units and such, you know, in many places in the world, there are large areas that operate outside market transactions, that operise, operate in black economy, grey economy, social enterprises, the cooperatives, all sorts of things of that sort. And in a sense, you know, that's not so unusual. This, this agenda wouldn't be that unusual in some of those kinds of contexts. But I don't think, I don't think I'm talking about an alternative, a replacement for capitalism and market-led development. I'm not talking about a replacement or alternative to growth. I'm talking about what you do when growth doesn't deliver. 
And does the planning system just throw up its hands, or can we equip it with some tools and approaches and ideologies and discourses that will enable it to actually achieve something? And I think there's enough going on. Everything I've said has been based on examples from the literature, you know, from uh, you know, what's happening out there and is reported in the world that's already going on that suggests this isn't, you know, this isn't pie in the sky. This is already happening in various kinds of places. It's a matter of supporting and facilitating it so that it can happen in more places. Was a question over here, also? Yes. Yeah, I actually wanted to be a bit soft from transparency, if I may. Uh, I wanted to continue this debate about capitalism and governance because uh, you also mentioned that for these local uh, issues, and, and you do realize that uh, the, uh, it's only locality and reducing things. Whereas, as I, I might have misunderstood you, uh, but I think your solution was uh, bigger government and, and to allocate more resources from the government for that. So wouldn't it be uh, more reasonable to decrease the size of government and, and maybe even envisage some kind of uh, city-states for the future, where, yes, yes we're going to have um, well, a more closer feel to what's happening in our environment, and so we can tackle that. Uh, very interesting idea. I mean, um, my immediate reaction to the idea of city-states, I think, is that um, you lose a lot of the opp opportunity for redistribution that I think Duncan was, was pointing us to in the first place. I'm not sure I was arguing for more state. Um, I'm not sure I have a view on bigger or smaller state in relation to this. This is much more at the level of kind of how you reshape the institutions of planning um, and the tools that are available to it, rather than arguing for a, for a bigger state per se. Um, maybe I've misunderstood you. Okay, we'll have one more question, and then, yes, sir. Yeah, but thanks very much, Yvonne. That was a very interesting reaction. I agree with you pretty much all of it. I'm a full time of the campaign for several leaders. So I think there's been a lot of good questions as well, which uh, provide a fairly similar one to some of the ones that have been raised. And I think I'm just taking a question of political economy, because as well as political, political economy. Then this government's got a focus on growth, as people have pointed out. But in particular, this government is particularly interested in deficit reduction. And I think that poses a couple of challenges for mm. the ideas you're putting forward in two respects. One is that, on one hand, we don't, many of us would like to see a, a program of hands on the house of But probably one of the main reasons why central government is resisting it mm. is councils have been borrowing to do that. And um, that would increase the overall public sector. Yeah, sure. Borrowing as well. yeah. And the other thing is more directly related to the point you're making about community land trusts, which again is some of the big group that I think are very, very important. But a major plank of this government's strategy of deficit reduction has actually been to follow off public sector land yes. trusts. Yeah. And yes. there's been a good example in my end recently where a community land trust has come forward and it's they it have one hell of a fight yeah. to, to actually yeah. get that CMT aspect to redevelop the side of the I think those points are, are, are absolutely well made. You know, I think, I think that's right. And the annoying thing about, the thing about public sector deficit reduction is it depends totally on what are the existing rules for what counts as public sector debt. You know, and the government does things simply to shift things around partly. It's not actually spending less. It just shifts it from one category to another so that that thing that's public sector debt is reduced because that's what the financial markets respond to. Um, so I, I take your points absolutely. Um, perhaps one could do some other creative accounting that would enable funds to be released in areas that don't contribute to the category of, of public sector debt.